into the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, chapter 20, where we're going to read from in just a couple of moments. Thank you so much for being here, for being a part of the efforts that we're putting forth. I appreciate this church so much. Appreciate the good that it does and appreciate the invitation to be with you over the course of the next few days. It's good to come back to Southern California where, again, we labored and lived for a dozen years and to see people that uh, we know and love and to meet new people or to at least see people that we haven't seen in quite some time. We're thankful for the presence of each of you as we continue to talk about, as Brother Brent pointed out, a very important subject, and that is what happens when time on earth ends. And as Brent pointed out, and as we talked about this morning, death is a certainty. It is not a maybe. It is a real life thing that we each have to prepare for. And some would say, well, I don't think that's very encouraging to talk about death. But we as Christians understand that when we die, we get to go home to paradise and ultimately, as we studied this morning, to heaven after the day of judgment. And that we also studied this morning that there's no such thing as a second chance, that there is finality associated with death. And so we've got to make sure that we get this right and that we do what the Lord has asked us to do. And we also need to make sure that we get these things right because we're talking to people in the world who have been misguided or mistaught doesn't mean that they're uh, dirty, rotten scoundrels or bad people. It just means that they've been mistaught on subjects, including but not limited to the subject of premillennialism. It's a long word, and as Brent suggested, it could be a long sermon. We could be in for a long ride this evening. But I, I promise you that it won't be terribly long. And that, as I also mentioned this morning, we could have an entire series of studies over the course of three or four days just on premillennialism and its trappings and what it teaches and why it's wrong. And we're just going to do a quick kind of overview of that tonight. And then, Lord willing, I invite you back, if you're able to, uh, either in person or to go to the Facebook page. Uh, we're going to talk tomorrow if there's such a thing as rapture. We're going to talk Tuesday about the subject of Armageddon. And then we're going to talk about the AD 70 doctrine, also known as realized eschatology. And so these are subjects that you may or may not be familiar with, and that's okay as well. But there are subjects that we need to have at least some cursory familiarity with in order to have a legitimate and decent conversation with those who would teach things contrary to what the Bible has to teach. We talked also this morning by way of introduction that in Galatians chapter 1 that Paul says that if someone comes to you, even an angel, and preaches something that is strange, something that is different, that you are to not believe that person, that that person is to be accursed, that person is to be uh, put over on the side as saying that person is teaching that which is wrong. So what I'd like to do tonight is to do a quick overview of premillennialism to talk about the thousand-year reign and what that may mean and more accurately what it does entail. And then as we will uh, discuss, as we did this morning, come away with two or three conclusions about this subject. And I hope this is helpful to you and we appreciate those who are watching from home who cannot be here as well and hope this is encouraging to you as well. I want to start with a quick overview of premillennialism. It's a long word. But it is a word that is associated with a doctrine that is taught by a great number of religious people. In fact, I would say that of religious people, and I haven't seen any polling or data on this, that there's a large number of churchgoers, of individuals who are in buildings much like this, who would believe in the physical 1,000-year reign of Jesus on the earth. And the teachings of it include a number of particular details. Let me share with you just three things. And if you get nothing else out of the lesson, I always thought that was interesting when preachers of old would say, if you get nothing else, does that mean that I can stop listening? I said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if you get these three things, you've got the basis of what premillennialism involves. Number one is that Jesus was always intent 
and always had it as his focus of establishing an earth-based kingdom. Now, you may say, well, I already know that that's not true because of passages in the New Testament, which we'll conclude with at the, at the end of our study tonight. But Jesus came to this earth, and he was going to set up a kingdom, and things went wrong when the Jews and the Romans teamed up and got involved, and they took his life from him. And so there's a number of things wrong with that, including the terminology that I've even used, because we know that Jesus' life wasn't really taken from him, but rather he laid it down in a very sacrificial way. Secondly, the church, which you and I are a part of, is a substitute or an alternative to the earth-based kingdom. Jesus came, lived for some 30 years, tried to get the kingdom going, was unable to do so, hit his head and said, what am I going to do now? And God the Father said, we've messed up. We did not succeed in our mission, so let's create the church as an alternative or a substitute. And we'll talk about that as we close as well. And thirdly, that Christ is going to return and actually establish an earth-based kingdom for a period of a thousand years. And so premillennialism comes from the word pre, which is before, millennial, which is the idea of a thousand-year period. And that's where we get the term from. When you think about premillennialism, if you like big words, well, you probably won't like my preaching because my preaching is pretty simple words because I'm not that smart. But I do know a couple of big words that are appropriate when it comes to premillennialism, and that is the concept of dispensationalism, which also has to be understood as well. Now, as good Bible students, I remember being in maybe third, fourth, fifth grade, which was a long time ago back in the days of Moses. And when we were in uh, third and fourth, fifth grade, we learned about dispensations and we learned it as being appropriately to refer to the different periods of biblical history. So you have the patriarchal period, you have the Jewish period or the Mosaic period, and you have the Christian periods of time. And we accurately would point out that we are living in the Christian era, the era of the church. And we've been doing that now for approximately 2,000 years. And I'm not belittling that point. I'm just saying that that's what we learned, and that's true. But it is also a term that is used especially by dispensationalists or premillennialists to refer to a period of seven periods wherein God's plan failed each time resulting in another plan, and that we are living in one of those periods, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. The idea is, is God put Adam and Eve in the garden in that first period, and he says, I've given them everything that they need. I've given them everything that they would ever want or ever have to their heart's desire, and life is going to be great in Eden, and he says, be fruitful and multiply, and life will be grand. And then Adam and Eve chose to sin. And then God again does this face plant where he says, well, I've messed up. So we've got to come up with something else. So he comes up with a better plan. And then that doesn't work. And he comes up with another plan. Ultimately, he gets to Jesus and says, well, Jesus is going to be my, my surefire way of success. And that doesn't work as we described just a moment or so ago. And so we appreciate the fact that all these different dispensations have occurred, but we don't appreciate the biblical teaching that God is making these particular mistakes. And so when you think about premillennialism, the idea is, is that the church, which you and I are a part of, is now in the fifth period of dispensations. The thousand-year reign of Jesus the Christ, which to a premillennialist could happen at any time, although they will point to events in current events and say these are the signs that we're getting closer to the end. Those of us that grew up in the 80s and 90s may be familiar with, for example, Prime Minister Mikhail Gorbachev. And Gorbachev, as you recall, had this large red birthmark on his head. And he was a bald man, so you could easily see it. And individuals said, there it is. That's the sign of the beast. Because everyone knew that the Soviet Union was going to last forever, and that was the sign of Satan. What happened to the Soviet Union? It came and went. And we are all familiar with all these different predictions or prophecies of 
uh, of men and women where they said the world is going to come to an end in this particular date. And every time they get it wrong. Or that the thousand year reign of Jesus when he comes back and he establishes an earth-based kingdom in Jerusalem is going to be the case. Well, we'll talk about more of that when we talk about Armageddon, Lord willing, on Tuesday evening as well as Wednesday with the AD 70 doctrine or realized eschatology. But the idea here is that the thousand year reign of Christ is the sixth and then eternity where we go home to heaven would be the seventh of those dispensations. Now, the interesting thing about this is, of course, that this is not taught in Scripture. But as we talked about this morning with purgatory, you can take verses and put them together and draw the incorrect conclusions. I've often said you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you pervert it enough. You can find where the Bible actually says there is no God. The Bible actually says there is no God. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I thought we're here worshiping God. We pray to God. Well, the Bible says there is no God, but it says the person who says there is no God is a fool, right? (laughs) So I can make the Bible say a lot of different things if I want to make it say that. We want to, as Brother Brent said, pull out the entire context, look at the entire book, look at what it was meaning, look at what it meant then, what it means now, what it will mean forever. And a key to understanding what's wrong with premillennialism is an understanding of the thousand years as well as the kingdom, which are the two things that I want us to talk about for just a couple of moments as we progress in our study. So I want to start with this idea of the thousand years by looking at Revelation chapter 20. If you would, read with me in Revelation chapter 20, and I want to read the first three, four, five verses. It says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So you can see... When it comes to purgatory, as we talked about in our, uh, in our study this morning, you could see when you look at these passages here that someone could walk away with, well, yeah, I can see that being the case. There's a thousand years, Satan bound, a thousand years, Jesus is going to reign. Someone's teach me that, putting together three or four scriptures, and boom, there you've got it. Premillennialism is real and authentic and viable. But that's not the case. Go ahead and read down through verse 4 and a little bit further where he says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ again for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We'll pick up in verse 7 here in just a couple of moments. But I want to start by acknowledging that there's two groups of people who are in focus here in Revelation chapter 20. That you have individuals who are faithful to the Lord and you have individuals who are unrighteous and are unfaithful to the Lord. Furthermore, picking up in verse 7, we read here that Satan will continue to have power for a time But the key here, it seems to me, is that he will eventually lose that power. Read with me in verse 7. When the thousand years have expired or come to a conclusion, Satan's going to be released from his prison, will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever so satan continues to have this power but eventually is going to lose that power 
And then if you read the next couple of verses, we come away with an additional conclusion, picking up in verse 11. He says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. And he says in verse 13 that the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast to the lake of fire. This is the second death. And he concludes in verse 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, some would say, you know, these are some scary verses. And I would argue they are scary. To read verse, 9, or verse 15 of chapter 20, for example, is a frightening idea that anyone whose name is not found written in the, the life book will be cast into the lake of fire. We have already referenced now three or four times Hebrews chapter 10 where it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so this is very serious. And the reason that we are spending six different lessons over the course of four days on the subject of time coming to an end is because, number one, it's going to happen either through your physical death and my physical death or through the end of the world that we'll experience collectively together and secondly, we have to give an answer. Every knee is going to bow. Not a single person who is present here is going to be immune from answering to God for the life that he or she has lived. So that brings us to this observation about verses 11 through 15, and that is judgment will occur, and the two groups will be judged and punished accordingly. Well, here's the problem as you look at chapter 20 and then back up to chapter 19 as well. Some here, and those that believe in premillennialism, argue that we're talking about a literal 1,000-year period of time, so that if Jesus were to return today in 2021, he would reign until 2121, and then after that, you would end the next dispensation of time that would give way to eternity. But if you take the thousand years as a literal statement, and I, and I would, let me pause here and say, there are some places in the Bible where literal and figurative can be a little bit dicey to figure out. And you have to be a really good student of the Bible and really understand the context and really appreciate everything. And that's certainly true with books here, like the book of Revelation. But let me just share with you four, five, six different little things that we need to appreciate as also being literal. The argument that I'm making is that if you have a thousand year period, and you're talking about a literal thousand years, talking about a literal 144,000 souls, as also referenced in the book of Revelation. You also have to have some other literal things. Go back to Revelation chapter 19 and pick up in verse 11, where it says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now, there are white horses that exist, so that is a literal white horse that can transpire. But you put that along with chapter 19, verse 12, which says, His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And so he will have eyes of fire. Are we talking about someone whose eyes are literally on fire? Or are we talking about someone in a figurative, emotional way has eyes of fire? Drop down to verse 14. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And then notice verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So are we talking about a literal sword in the mouth? Well, there are sword swallowers, I suppose. 
individuals who have this ability to somehow elongate their esophagus and trick us or maybe make us believe that they're doing these things. But I hasten to say that these things seem to be more figurative than they are literal. Certainly in chapter 19, verse 19, it says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. In chapter 20, we read that just a few moments ago. We won't reread it, but in verse 1, it talks about a chain and a bottomless pit. And then it talks about the second death. We sometimes talk about life in a way in which it is figurative in nature. We aren't going to live again in a physical way with our physical bodies, for in fact, heaven cannot accept our physical bodies. Rather, we will be changed into a remarkable, incorruptible person or being. So the scriptures teach here that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And I would make the argument, and I hope that you're seeing with me, that we conclude that indeed Satan will be and is bound, but he does have some power associated with him. To, to say that Satan is powerless would be not only anti-biblical, it would be anti-common sense. Because we know that Satan has a role in our lives. Go back and read the book of Job, for example, and you see where Satan was granted permission to be able to attack Job physically, mentally, financially, and emotionally. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in a passage that you are likely familiar with, he says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take he lest he fall. And then he says in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Nowhere in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13 does it say Satan is powerless. It says Satan has the ability to tempt you, but God grants you the, the every ability to resist those temptations. And in his very pointed letter, James says in chapter 4 and in verse 7 of that letter, he says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we need to appreciate that Satan does have certain abilities, does have certain powers. But we also need to, and time fails us, to really delve into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which I referenced this morning, where it says, in the end, Satan will be totally destroyed, annihilated, and his power taken away. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we could read probably a good 25 verses to establish the context, but let's read just four. In verse 54, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he asks those questions in quoting from Hosea, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? We talked about Hades this morning as being this intermediate state or the place where those who have deceased or are deceased go. He says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but, verse 57, we said, but is a very important biblical word for Bible study. He says, thanks be to God who gives, he says, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I think it's important for us to acknowledge that there is this thousand years but that it seems as if we're not talking about a literal 1,000 year period, but rather a fixed period where Satan has certain abilities, but Satan doesn't have limitless abilities. He cannot destroy you. He may take your life away, or God may allow him to take your life away for standing for the truth. And indeed, 1 Peter chapter 3 and, verse, uh, and 1 Peter chapter 4, we talked this morning, tells us that if we're going to suffer, we suffer for the kingdom. We suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. But let me also suggest that it's important for us to spend just three or four minutes talking about the kingdom and what is meant by the kingdom. Premillennialism is associated with and deals with the subject of the kingdom so much that a couple of observations are merited. Sometimes the term kingdom is 
is synonymous with the Lord's church that you and I are a part of. For example, in Matthew chapter 16, he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And he says that in, in chapter 16, verse 18, as we looked at this morning, he says, my kingdom, he says, will last. Nobody will stand in the way of it. Nobody will prevail against it, including the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, the kingdom of heaven. Or in Mark chapter 9, in verse 1, Jesus, in a reference that I made uh, point to, said, Surely I say to you that there are those here standing who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. So those that would argue that the kingdom isn't here yet, those that would, for example, pray thy kingdom come and mean we want the kingdom to, to be established and not mean something else because there are different ways of looking at the kingdom concept, those are individuals who are in direct violation of what Mark 9.1 teaches when he says that there are those of you who are alive who may be, let's say, 25 years old who are going to live for another 40 or 50 years as life expectancy was less in the first century, and you're going to see the kingdom come with power and be present with power. So that seems to be the church. And those very individuals, in fact, just years later, would be alive when Acts chapter 2 rolls around and the kingdom comes in the form of the church. There are times where the word kingdom is used in a slightly different way, and it seems to be exclusive to a future kingdom, a future existence, or the future heaven itself. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, in your New Testaments, and he says in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, indicating what he testified beforehand and the sufferings of Christ and glories that would follow, to them, he says, verse 12, it revealed not to themselves, but to us who are ministering the things which have not been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you and sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into, a passage that we used while partaking of the Lord's Supper early this morning. The reason that I point out that passage is because we're looking for something in the future. What are we looking for? We're looking for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that is the future of heaven. So you could say we are part of the kingdom searching for the kingdom. And I think as long as the context is established, that would be appropriate. And when we talk about the kingdom coming, it could mean either A, prior to the kingdom being established in church, or B, we're looking for the kingdom that's going to come in heaven where we will one day be able to live. Well, that brings us to the close of our lesson, and that is what is the biblical conclusion? And I'm going to share with you three things, and I want to look at a half a dozen passages before we close out this evening. I would make the argument, and I think you will see with me, that by examining Scripture, there are three reasons why premillennialism is a problem, why it's something that we don't believe. Number one, even though premillennialism is this idea of an earth-based kingdom where Jesus comes back and he reigns for this period of time, we acknowledge so much that an earth-based kingdom was never a part of the New Testament discussion. How do I know that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to look at two passages in Luke, one in Mark and one in John, and we'll read through these passages very quickly and make just a comment or two about them. I want to start actually in the book of Luke, chapter 19. Luke 19 is a pivotal passage because uh, this is where we are getting close to the end uh, of the life of Jesus on this earth. And in verse 11, it says, As they heard these things... He spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem, which was going to be a very important place, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So just kind of shelve that in your brain for a moment and just put that up there as a piece. They were looking for the kingdom of God to appear immediately. Well, go back maybe just a few pages in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, this time in chapter 10, 
and pick up in verse 35. In verse 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He says, What do you want me to do for you? And then he says in verse 37, without using the word kingdom, but clearly talking about the coming of the kingdom, he says, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your glory or in your kingdom. So shelve that in your brain for just a moment and then go back to the book of Luke, this time to the ultimate chapter the, the, of, chapter, of, of the book, chapter 24 and verse 21. Now this is the famous scene on the road to the village or the city of Emmaus. Cleopas and his unnamed friend are on the road. And what did they acknowledge? What did they admit in verse 21 was this. We were hoping that it was Jesus, this character that we're talking about. Now, remember, they're having a conversation with Jesus, but unbeknownst to them, they didn't know it was Jesus. And he said, we thought that it was going to be him that was going to redeem Israel. What does that mean, redeem Israel? Set up a kingdom and overturn the Romans and run them back all the way to the city of Rome and destroy them. And he would set up this kingdom and King Jesus would be the new emperor of their land. That's what they were looking for. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Now, Jesus would go and respond to them in verse 25. And the first thing out of his mouth, is he says, O oh, foolish ones. Of little faith you are, and slow of heart to believe, and all the prophets have spoken. In essence, I did not come to establish a kingdom on this earth. And then in John chapter 18, verse 36, a fourth and final passage on this, and one that I think really kind of nails the coffin, is verse 36 where he says, My kingdom is not of this world. He says in verse 36, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants, my followers, would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Now Pilate goes on and asks, he says, Okay, then are you saying that you are a king? Or are you not a king? In verse 37. And Jesus says, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come unto the world that I should bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Did you notice what Jesus acknowledged? He says, Yes, I am a king. And remember, Pilate unwittingly testified to that when he says, The king of the Jews, and he placed that on the tablet above Jesus. And you remember the Jewish leader said, Please correct that and make it so that he said that he was the king of the Jews. Remember that whole big debacle? And he says, what I have written, I have written. And Pilate unknowingly confessed that Jesus is indeed the king. So Jesus is a king. He, we acknowledge that. We can pray to our God the Father and rightly pray through Jesus the king. And that would be right to say. But the kingdom is not of this world. Which is why we don't get all up in arms like many in the world do about physical Israel and physical Jerusalem and a physical kingdom that would otherwise exist in this world. And that's also why we remember that we are part of a heavenly kingdom with heavenly goals and heavenly priorities and spiritual perspectives. I know that this is sometimes difficult for us. We live in a world that is saturated with so much negative news about the world in which we live, about the politics of the, the country and the division that transpires. And I'm not suggesting that we can't be involved in those things and have a stake and have some sort of a stay. But we've got to remember that, as we said this morning, this world is not home. If in this life we have hope, and only in this life, we are of all men the most miserable or pitiable. And I've run into some Christians from time to time who get so caught up in the, in the affairs of this world. And they get so concerned about what's going on in this world. That's like, wait a minute. Remember that you're only going to be here for 80 years plus or minus 10 or 15. You're only going to be here for that. This world isn't home. That's not where our priority lies. Our priority lies with a perspective of a spiritual nature because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to do spiritual things for spiritual people for spiritual purposes.
And remember Jesus, what he said in John chapter 6? He chided and got after the followers who came after him. He says, you aren't here because of my teachings about the kingdom. I'm paraphrasing. You're here because you want more food, because you want physical things. Jesus says, that's not what I'm here about. I'm here to help you spiritually. And that makes life very difficult for us as members of the church. It makes life difficult for those who preach or serve as elders who consistently have people come in from the streets and say, I need help financially, physically, medically, whatever the case may be. And we say, well, our focus here as members of the Lord's church is of a spiritual nature. That's what we are concerned with financially and otherwise. Secondly, to argue premillennialism as being a valid theory is to argue the insufficiency of God. Because premillennialism, as part of its doctrine, suggests that God goofed, that he messed up, that there were mistakes along the way. Because you have these periods of dispensations wherein God keeps recreating the plan. Remember that God's plans are eternal and that God never made a mistake. He never will make a mistake. Turn, if you would, to two passages, one in Ephesians, which you already knew we were going to go to, and the other in 1 Peter. But one of those is in Ephesians chapter 1. Recently finished a uh, probably uh, eight to ten week study of the book of Ephesians with uh, a lady from church, and it was a really rewarding study. And the book of Ephesians is nicely kind of divided right down the middle into uh, themes but it talks about uh, the riches of God's grace. It talks about the mystery that is delivered. And it is where Paul is talking to Christians, trying to get them to understand God's plan for their lives. And he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, not some spiritual blessings, but every single spiritual blessing comes through Jesus Christ. Just as he, now watch verse 4, he chose us in him. And then if you want to underline things in your Bible, or as my history teacher said in the ninth grade, he says, I want you to circle it. I want you to put a star by it. I want you to prick your finger and put a drop of blood on this page because this is important stuff. He says, before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. I take that to mean what it means. And that is, before the foundation of the world, before thousands of years ago, whenever the world was created and spoken into existence, God was already there. How long has God been around? He's been there forever. Can I explain that? Absolutely not. Can I understand that? Not smart enough to do that. None of us have the capacity to really understand eternity in that way. But before the foundation of the world, God said, I'm going to have a chosen people. And it's people not that I choose. I'm going to choose this person over this person. But I'm going to choose individuals who obey me. And by that obedience, I will extend my grace to them. Paul or Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 in, in a similar vein. And he said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, he says, He indeed was foreordained, this is Jesus, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who's the he there? It's the Christ. It's the Messiah. It's our Savior. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Peter really wanted to get that message across that Jesus was the design of God because God knew that mankind would need a Savior and need a Savior desperately. And let me suggest thirdly that premillennialism is a problem because it waters down and dilutes the importance of the bride of Jesus Christ, the church. Go back to the book of Ephesians, where we'll conclude this afternoon. And I want us to read in chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3 is, is a powerful chapter. It's one that we would do well to study in great detail. But I want to read beginning in verse 8 and read six verses. In verse 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints... This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus. 
and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by what? By the church. God's wisdom is known by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, the eternal purpose, not just a, whoops, I made a mistake, let's create the church. The eternal purpose of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, of God, accomplished in Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul saying, don't lose sight of the fact that I'm suffering for your sake and for the sake of the church in a universal sense. And that is something that I'm willing to do today, willing to do tomorrow, willing to do forever. Because that's how important the church is. We can go back and read Acts 20, verse 28. We can read Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18 again, as we did this morning. We can read a host of passages that talk about how vital the church is. The church is the most important organization, or as some have suggested, an organism that has ever existed. It may not be the oldest thing in the world, but it's the most important thing in the world. And when it was established 2,000 years ago, it was not an afterthought of God. It was not a plan B or C or D of God. It was part of God's eternal wisdom and preparation for a people that needed to be redeemed and added to something where they were called out of the world, which is what it means, and part of this assembly, part of this organism that allows for salvation to flow because of Jesus Christ himself. That's what premillennialism goes against. And that's why we are opposed to it. And that's why we say these things and say them boldly and we make no apology for it. And so we conclude with this question that we will conclude with throughout the course of this week that when time ends, we have to be ready because there won't be a, a thousand year reign where we say, well, I've got a thousand years to figure this thing out. When this world comes to an end, it will come to an end and the works within it will be burned up as Peter would write in his second epistle. In his second letter, he says, everything that we know is going to be gone and going to be destroyed. And we've got to be ready for that. Many of us probably will experience death if the Lord, well, we will all experience death if the Lord does not return. But whether we leave this earth in a coffin or we leave this earth caught up to be with our Lord, as outlined in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, we do not know. But all of us will stand before judgment. Behold, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that this Jesus is both Lord and Master. I've always thought that's interesting. An atheist is one day going to bow down on his knees and say, you are God, and that's the Son of God right there. And it'll be too late to make that confession, to make it count for something for salvation. And we don't want that to include you. And so if you are not a Christian, we are hoping that you'll become a child of God this very evening. We'll baptize you tonight. Maybe you'd like to study more on this subject or study more on the idea of what does it take to be a Christian? Um, I want to learn more about what it means to be a child of God. I want to be prepared for the end when time ends. And we'd be glad to help you in that process. So we'll study with you. We'll study with you tonight. We'll study with you tomorrow, whenever it's convenient for you. And we'll answer your questions with the Bible, God's divine word. If you are a child of God and you are not living correctly and you need to make some sort of correction, which involves a public nature, we're happy to help you with that. If it's private, where you need to go to God in prayer, do so even while we sing. Or if we can pray with you as you are struggling to improve, we're happy to help you. Just be ready for when time ends, and we'd love to help you in that process. If we can help you in any way, let us know while together we stand and while we sing.